through solar, actually giving the energy back to the earth. This has spurred an entire industry, and it's an ex excellent example, I think, of how um, the government can set policy that industry fills, that creates profit and creates social good, reducing pollution. It would always happen, I guess, over a long period of time, but a government can be a catalyst with the policies they make. One example here that I'll show is, um, I'll, let, I'll let it speak for itself. Give it the volume. Power Choice Program. This is a short commercial from the state of New Jersey power company that provides customers with a choice of where their power comes from. And they can choose to buy green sources. And the green sources cost about 12% more but a lot of people buy it. Another example of how the policy, business, and consumerism can be strategically aligned. I chose it for cleaner air for the future. Because it's smart. Welcome to the Clean Power Choice Program from the state of New Jersey. It's a way to get electricity from clean, renewable energy sources like solar, small hydro, and wind power. I chose it for the shore. For less pollution. Participating in the Clean Power Choice Program is a great way for you to help New Jersey use energy more wisely and help protect our environment. Visit NJCleanEnergy.com or call us today. Look in your electric bill for more information on how to sign up. So this is literally voting with your pocketbook. Creating social good. There's still profits. This is not a not-for-profit. This is a utility. And it's aligned with the policies of the state of New Jersey just as with the state of California. Now some people may say, Rob, I'm a uh, manufacturer that sells to intermediaries. This isn't my business. I don't sell to the end consumer. I say that's ridiculous. Everybody's being held accountable. <coughs> At Omnicom, where I work, and I have the pleasure of working you know, with some uh, very brilliant people around the world in the communication space, our clients demand a number of things from us. One of them, is diversity. If we're not as diverse with some clients in the staff we have, they can't even hire us. All right? So you can hold your supply chain as accountable as you'd like. And um, it's really who are your customers' customers then if you're not selling to the final uh, market and how can you align yourself? Adidas is uh, an excellent example. If you go to their 2007 CSR report, you see that they have a very open and transparent view of the way they work <coughs> and how they select suppliers. They audit their suppliers for fair trade practices, for workers' rights practices worldwide. It's a tremendous initiative, and it's not advertised. I've uh, talked about advertising. In the world of social networking, this information gets known. You don't always need to advertise it. Um, an Indian <coughs> company, Motorola, uh, winning uh, a green award. Do you think they can leverage this as the way they sell to suppliers and as they work with suppliers that sell to them? Of course. And this is another example of how an industry or a body can certify and create a value chain that ultimately consumers will pay more for. I picked up on uh, YouTube just before I left home that uh, says maybe better than uh, I could possibly say on the uh, phenomenon of uh, social media. Thanks for watching Hope in Advertising. The millennial generation has been exposed to more brand messages than any generation before them. What happens when you hear the same thing over and over and over again? You stop listening. Millennials are immune to traditional advertising and traditional marketing. The model is breaking, the American economy is sinking, and companies must start reaching towards a millennial audience. America, if you want us, you better start thinking social responsibility. The 2006 Cone Report showed that we're willing to change brands 89% of the time if a company is associated with a good cause, and 69% of us consider a company's social and environmental stance when choosing where to shop. We've taken the first step. 
It's time for boomer and silent generation executives to start putting their advertising dollars where it matters most, in environmental and social change. We've already made money for companies who have invested in environmental and societal problems. Show us change, and we'll show you dollars. So this is a living, breathing example of what I'm talking about. Communicating, to you. that's not advertising, but that's people reaching across. One last example, and then I will uh, kindly be seated. This is the new 17-inch MacBook Pro. It has a revolutionary new battery that runs up to an astonishing 8 hours per charge and can be recharged up to a thousand times. That's a typical 5-year lifespan, which is nearly 3 times longer than batteries in most notebooks and means fewer batteries in landfills. Just another reason, the new MacBooks are the world's greatest family of notebooks. Question on that one: Is that advertising, or is, is that the news? Is that their business? Do you think they understand their customers? Do you think they embarked on a big investment in batteries just because they're competing with Lenovo and Lenovo's? They're trying to own a special place in the mind of the consuming public that breeds loyalty and responsibility. Of course, delivering profits, but at the same time, delivering a social good. These aren't competing thoughts. You could call it a triple bottom line. You could call it a lot of things. But it's a win-win. But it is a business strategy that benefits when government and charity are thought about at the same time. Thank you. Uh, uh, I thank you for making it all the way to be with us today. Uh, I must share with all of you that around the time when we started planning the domain capitalism from came around, seven months ago, eight months ago. We engaged with the event management company. Uh, and uh, they basically got a company. And this kind of uh, reflects on what we're trying to do because Henry Ford once said that you know, a business that only makes money is a very poor business. And uh, this company was planning to give us some money and they wanted to kind of do this on a big scale uh, and do it in the Taj hotels across India. And uh, we were faced with this dilemma is, should we do it on that scale or should we do it the way we want to do it? Uh, we didn't go with the company because uh, they're doing everything wrong with the environment in Odisha and Andhra and other places. Uh, I won't name the company for being politically correct, often politically very incorrect. And that's when we decided that we won't go with any company because we're doing something which is an index to kind of create 100 businesses and business leaders. We'll kind of keep it free uh, of any conflict. And we kind of approached various friends, then being one of them who came to our aid and said, okay, you know, we'll at least support you to put it together. Rob who said, okay, don't worry, I'll come down. He came down at his own cost. And we decided to do it that way. And then we kind of, kind of, you know, improvised and said, let's see how we can adapt. And that's how we started kind of thinking of doing it in universities and Xavier's Christ and India. And so having said that, thank you Rob for coming and being with us today. I would now invite uh, uh, Lynn D'Souza, who is the chairperson of the Dentas Media Group, to come and share her thoughts. And she's going to, speaking, uh, going to be speaking about communicating CSR initiatives to stakeholders and beneficiaries. Lynn D'Souza. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Lynn D'Souza, and I work with uh, Lindas, uh, which is an advertising and uh, agency, and we look after all the media media buying and media placements. And um, I just want to say thank you to Jerry for your um, enthusiasm in making this happen. Uh, just, you know, I, I, we all, some of us here, speak often at conclaves, which are at uh, big five-star hotels and so on. And there are a lot of people that attend them. And they're always related to business and doing better in the business that you do. And I think it's a very telling thing that uh, to get a humane capitalism conclave together, to get our people to come and attend something that's to do with the uh, charitable side of you is more difficult. And it, it says that, but from very small acorns, I think very large oaks will grow. So I believe that you know, among the 50 of us who are present here in this room, even if 10 of us go back, 
and make a difference to the companies that we work for or the companies that we interact with, even in a small way, it will be the beginning of a movement that is so much needed in this country. Uh, what Rob has described is uh, what happens in America, and I, I visit uh, America every month, so it's, you really, really see the difference between corporates there and people there as, as, as a society.